Okay, I'm pretty sorry about this, but I'm in trouble trying to uh, share my ah. Okay, select them to all screen. Yes. What's going on? Oh, I've got to be kidding me. Uh, hey, um, yeah, I'm actually having trouble trying to share my screen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did, did you try the, the third pictogram down, the fourth? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, then there's a pop up in my browser yes. saying, um, <laughs> yes. and now my security on my Mac is actually complaining. Yes, um, because you need to allow uh, the right uh, to uh, use camera and microphone in your brother, browser and in your uh, system. I thought I'd already actually done that, unfortunately. Okay, and I have to hang on. Ah, cool. Everybody. Just um, John will come back very soon. We, we, we ask you uh, some minutes of patience. Thank you very much for being here and for attending this, uh, this workshop. Okay, and the link. No. Finally, hi, so I'm really sorry about this. Hopefully um, everybody can now see my main screen. Um, yeah, we can, we so can, can you put it full screen if you want to show your slides? Yeah, I'm just about to do that, yeah. Perfect. Stage is yours. Okay. No, no right. Thank you very much. Yes, I can't see your slides anymore. Your it's your back. Yeah, cool. So, okay. good luck. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so finally, sorry about the delay, everybody. So we're here to talk today about this idea of uh, building an app mesh. Um, so we really need to see uh, where um, the bridge is between this world of uh, microservices and, and uh, this idea of a service mesh and, and how APIs uh, uh, relate to that. Uh, it's important for us to appreciate that um, in putting in place uh, an API management uh, system and uh, policy enforcement is not incompatible with the idea of a service mesh. Uh, for me, they are complementary. Uh, and in fact, uh, APIs are driving the need for implementing uh, what we can call a, a service mesh. 
And that's primarily because of, well, two reasons. Uh, the two reasons uh, have always been there, they're historical, um, and that's related to um, what I've learned over the years in my career, uh, what are the major problems uh, that occur in production. In reality, only two problems occur. You either have performance-related issues, uh, the server is no longer responding, you don't have any resources left, or the other problem is this dependency based. In other words, uh, somebody's um, you know done an update, and that update uh, causes a, a conflict. Uh, there's a dependency that's gone wrong somewhere, and uh, basically the production system goes down. And uh, these two problems are only becoming, in in reality, um, bigger problems for the future. Uh, because of APIs. APIs uh, um, require uh, varying levels of performance. So in the past, uh, when we were deploying solutions in production, we would often uh, already be pretty much aware of what the traffic volume is going to be. We would you know, be able to, you know, we wouldn't have any surprises. Uh, when it comes to APIs, because of the dynamic way that people can onboard APIs, the way that we can do mashups and use APIs in ways that we hadn't perceived at the beginning in uh, directly in our know, production environment, uh, your your traffic or, or performance requirements can change quite rapidly. And it could be seasonal, it could be daily. Uh, and so we need performance that's much more elastic than what we had in the past. And also, if you want to ensure that your APIs can respond to business requirements quickly, you need a solution that is agile. In other words, you need to be able to expect frequent updates into productions. So these two issues will only become more and more important unless we find a solution. So just to repeat why uh, these two issues are, are problematic, we need to look at a historical platform. So here we can see our traditional platform based on an application server. Uh, all of the different components are running within the same uh, container within the application server itself. Um, so there are lots of dependencies. Uh, um, and also, um, the problem from a performance perspective is the only way of actually improving the performance of this type of architecture is to put in place what we would call a, a high availability cluster. So we duplicate the application server, we have a load balancer, and we can distribute the load over several nodes. Um, however, this doesn't adapt to the modern world. If you're in a uh, hosting your uh, your solution in the cloud, this is going to be extremely costly and uh, to maintain um, because you're duplicating um, unnecessary uh, parts of your solution. If you are thinking, if we look at this particular example here, we, we've actually identified the performance issue is within the catalog component of our uh, application server. It's the, the catalog that's being um, overused. Um, so it's rather a waste to, to duplicate the entire application server in order to uh, fulfill the, the catalog requirements. Uh, ideally, we would like to just uh, allocate further resources to catalog uh, and none of the other components. And so uh, this uh, traditional approach is static. You can't easily uh, clone your application server um, quickly um, in an ad hoc manner. This is something that you would actually size in advance. You put in place a, a, a cluster of three nodes, and that's, that's what it would be unless you plan and foresee in the future to upgrade the number of nodes. So we need something that's much more elastic than that. Coming back to the other issue that we talked about, which was to do with uh, the dependencies. Well, here we can see an example where we have two developers that need to make updates into the production environment. One's been working on a new version of the catalog and another on the shopping cart. And here we can see a problem where they both have varying requirements and varying dependencies. The catalog requires uh, a new version of a framework, uh, whereas the shopping cart uh, only requires an upgraded platform only. Um, um, and in order to get these two components to work, we basically have potentially incompatible requirements. So, um, you know, your development teams have to work much more in coordination. One development team may be held back because of the requirements or impositions of another team. That is not agile. It's not a way of working in the future. And the worst case scenario is obviously we actually put in place these two components because unlike this nice diagram, uh, the dependencies aren't visible. The developer isn't aware that there's a dependency um, in place. And so they put them in production and uh, everything falls down. So basically your production server um, fails. Uh, this is historically the biggest problem we would have in production. 
um, and hence why we have to avoid that. So as you can see from what we just saw there, the idea is we take our monolithic application and we break it out into separate components. Um, this is the premise of moving to what we call a microservice world. So in this case, we have separate runtime containers for each of our components. Uh, each one can run in, in isolation. Uh, its dependencies are localized. Um, and so they're not going to impinge on one upon uh, upon each other. Nice thing is as well is you can have uh, much more frequent updates into a production. You can uh, practice daily builds. You can put in place uh, canary releases. You can even have multiple versions of the same component running in parallel in production and then have a switch between them or have different applications that uh, will use the different versions. Um, so it allows you to have an environment that's much more agile. You can actually update much more frequently to production. Uh, you can start practicing a, a true DevOps uh, development cycle where developers work on their own projects, so they can work independently, they can um, really uh, promote this kind of agile deployment strategy. People don't have to work the weekend uh, with their fingers crossed, hoping the production system is going to go live without problems. Uh, we're in a much more kind of robust uh, scenario. If we go back to what we talked about performance, we can see that now we've, we can uh, solve the performance problem. If we move those two components out of the way and concentrate on the catalog, we can see that we can actually now duplicate the number of instances of our catalog. Um, uh, but we only do this temporarily. So this would be done dynamically in production in real time based on the health of our catalog component. So you know, with modern uh, container tools, we can actually determine whether the catalog component is actually overloaded. I duplicate the, the catalog into a three node uh, instance like we see here, uh, we can that will take the stress. And then the idea is that once that peak has passed, we can actually then reduce the number of nodes. This is much more cost effective, especially if we're running in a SaaS environment. Um, and it also allows you to then allocate resources more appropriately to other components that may uh, require uh, uh, those resources. Um, however, like anything, nothing is free. Um, so uh, microservices can be hard. Uh, moving to this type of approach implicates uh, a lot of new technologies. So you're going to have to be uh, aware that uh, you know you, you need to start knowing how to build images and uh, manage those images, how to run the images, i.e., how do we actually uh, execute the containers and do lifecycle uh, around those containers. So that implicates knowledge around Docker. Uh, to run those containers, you need to know uh, Kubernetes. Um, in order to build those images in a robust, reliable manner, you need to implement a DevOps pipeline. So you're going to have to be happy with scripting and all the various tools around that, such as Jenkins, Ansible, Helm, and so on. Um, and uh, on top of that, we've got some uh, runtime issues. Um, as you can see here, you risk having what we call uh, spaghetti uh, code. So we're actually going back to the old days of the 1990s, let's say, uh, where we have um, too much uh, too much connectivity going on between the components. We don't have code level dependency, dependencies anymore, so that's a huge advantage. But we have this kind of spaghetti code problem. And uh, as the image shows, it's not just spaghetti, it's basically spaghetti on fire if you get it wrong, because uh, um, the, the risks involved uh, can be much more strict. So it's important to bear in mind that you need to also implement a service mesh so that you can actually manage the interdependencies between these different components. It's not as bad as what we talked about before with the code dependencies, um, because it's contractual. Uh, it will be based on a kind of what I call a, a formal interface that we need to identify between these different components. But you need to add an abstraction layer so that you create what we call a service layer uh, to separate and decouple these components so that you can actually manage uh, the proper versioning, uh, replacement of components uh, in production without things breaking. So that's where, uh, for instance, the service mesh comes into play, which feeds into uh, our next slide, in fact. So, um, well, you know, if I'm going to list what are the issues uh, with microservices, um, we talked about this idea of, uh, you know, how we actually manage the dependencies between them. So that links to accessibility. We also have a dis discoverability problem. Um, I mean, at the moment, we haven't really talked about APIs. And one of the 
brilliant features of APIs is the idea that we can actually formalize the, the contract of our API through the a Swagger file. We can actually uh, put in place an API portal and publicize those APIs and give people the ability to uh, do onboarding and so on. Uh, nowhere have we seen that yet within the microservice uh, architecture, and unfortunately, it, it isn't there. Um, we also have a problem with traceability. So you will probably have some kind of logging that you can uh, access at the uh, container level. But um, you know, in reality, you, you want to be able to see the A to Z uh, um, logging of a particular transaction. So if you have a transaction that actually implicates a number of different containers, you want to be able to trace that from A to Z across the different containers. So traceability is a, a big issue here. And uh, although we talked about this idea of having this different versions of the same container uh, in production, um, if you want to have multiple versions of the same container, it would be up to you normally to actually impose some kind of naming convention so that there won't be conflicts. And then also add, as we said, this abstraction layer so that you can actually route appropriately between the different versions. Natively, uh, with uh, uh, Kubernetes and microservices, uh, you won't have that. And I've also added a point uh, that is uh, something that you have to be careful of when migrating from a traditional approach to, to this new architecture, and that is latency. In the traditional architecture where we saw our monolithic application, all the components are tightly coupled together. Uh, your, your catalog will be accessing directly uh, uh, um, you know, a service level, you know, kind of a, a localized level, uh, the persistence layer, for instance. Whereas with, within a microservice architecture, those containers will be potentially running in different data centers. Uh, there's going to be a network, a lot more network hops between those components. So you have a, a risk of increased latency um, uh, when comparing with a, a traditional architecture. So we have to be, be careful of that as well. So the service mesh will help you uh, to a degree so I've kind of color coded which bullet points I think personally that a service mesh will help you with. It improves discoverability because, as we said, we can define this service layer, which will uh, ensure that you don't have to reference uh, containers specifically. And the service mesh is very powerful for giving you the abilities to, to manage uh, routing uh, between versions, uh, filtering uh, and so on. Um, personally, though, from an accessibility point of view, I think it gives nothing because uh, you still have no contractualized interfaces. You can know that you have a microservice available, but uh, without looking at very low level um, uh, YAML files, there's no way of actually knowing how you actually call uh, that uh, service or knowing what the payload is or the signature or you know uh, what the properties are. Um, it is very good at traceability. If you put in place a service mesh, most service meshes will give you the ability to be able to now visualize uh, the dependencies between the different runtime containers. It will also be able to show you uh, transactions as they go flow through those different containers. Um, so that's a real nice add uh, given to you by, uh, by these solutions. And it also improves lifecycle because as you said, as part of this uh, abstraction layer of giving you uh, services, um, it will allow you to actually uh, manage uh, the versioning between different containers. Uh, and just uh, on top of latency, nothing at all, obviously. So, you know, we're here to talk about APIs. So how, how can APIs uh, help us? Well, in relation to um, uh, what we see here with the service mesh, as we said, discoverability is hard at the moment. If I want to call any of these microservices, uh, there's no single endpoint. Uh, you know, I don't have a single URL I can use. They're, they're all based on different endpoints. Uh, the, the path and the resource naming it will be completely arbitrary and completely different, perhaps. Um, in order to understand it, I will have to go through YAML files. Uh, not very nice. Um, so there is a value add of adding what we call uh, an additional layer. So we're not talking about replacing a service mesh. We're talking about enriching the service mesh by adding an API layer on top. Um, at the beginning, we were thinking of calling it the API mesh, but uh, unfortunately, it doesn't sound uh, sounds very insulting if you say that uh, in to a Frenchman, because it actually sounds like API mesh. It sounds like you're mocking their accent. So uh, it doesn't sound right to me. Um, so we much prefer the term app mesh. It rolls off the tongue in French and in English much better. Um, but basically, we're talking about leveraging the power of APIs with the service mesh to give a vision that's much cleaner, 
So basically now I, uh, I can actually document the services through a single API um, and expose uh, that documentation through an API portal. Uh, I now have a single uh, routing endpoint. Um, I now can use uh, the concept of uh, the resource path to distinguish between the different services. And uh, I should, through the documentation, have a good idea of how to actually leverage that API in advance. Um, in addition to that, it will also allow us to distinguish between what we call east-west and north-south traffic. Uh, when we're looking at the service mesh, um, you're looking at much more uh, transactions uh, that are internal to your organization. And so the priorities of what you need to do in order to secure and manage uh, those services is quite different to often what you're going to be doing in a north-south perspective. Um, if you're exposing an API, it's probably because you want to be able to allow people to use those services um, outside of the Kubernetes sphere. You know, if you're running within Kubernetes, it's great. You know, you can use these services. You can go through the service mesh. However, uh, in a lot of the cases, you're going to be wanting to uh, leverage these services from outside, i.e. through because you have legacy applications. We're going to have legacy applications for a long time. Um, but also because of partners and external, uh, you know, collaborators, they're always going to be there. We hope to have more and more collaborators in the future. And also another aspect, which is really important, we are building more and more mobile apps. And so if you're building an iPhone or Android app, then obviously you're going to want to go through uh, an API to do that. So, uh, and in which case the, the policies and security that you want to put in place are going to be quite different uh, in relation to the service mesh. So we want to be able to add to the service mesh. We don't want to break it though, because uh, rather than imposing these rules within the service mesh layer, which effectively could uh, impact the reliability of the performance of your existing uh, interactions, uh, we can actually add this extra layer on top through what we call the app mesh. Um, and just bear in mind that if you have a, a decent API solution, such as software AGs, uh, they will often solve the latency problem because um, a good API solution will often uh, involve uh, providing some kind of distributed cache so that you can short circuit uh, uh, too many hops um, and uh, reuse existing uh, data uh, if available. So, so these um, are kind of the things that we're looking at uh, when we're combining our app mesh with a service mesh. Let's start looking at uh, um, our demo that we're going to see today. So um, here we can see uh, a use case where we're providing uh, a number of different microservices. These microservices are basically going to provide us an ability to, uh, to list a number of books, um, get the details on the books, such as ISBN, the, the name of the author, and so on, and also be able to contribute reviews so we can review the book and also provide a number of stars and rate the book uh, and so on. And in front of this, we have a small microservice, which is actually a small web app uh, representing a web page, so that we can actually visualize uh, these books uh, directly from within uh, the Kubernetes uh, platform. Uh, so as I said, in order to implement this, we're going to use Kubernetes. Kubernetes will be responsible for uh, the runtime, i.e. You know, ensuring that these containers are running reliably. Uh, if one goes down, it's Kubernetes that will restart the failed microservice. Uh, we can also, uh, thanks to Kubernetes, manage this idea of redundancy, having multiple instances of the same microservice and, and using the Kubernetes uh, load balancer switch between them. Uh, so we have all the scalability advantages. Um, and then for the service mesh, we decided for this demo to use Istio. It's not the only solution uh, that's important to, to point out, uh, but it is certainly a uh, flavor of the month at the moment. And so using the service mesh uh, of Istio, which imposes these uh, sidecar uh, proxies that are in place, uh, imposed in front of each uh, microservice, it will allow us to implement the uh, routing rules uh, put in place this abstraction layer to manage uh, the routing between the different microservices. It will give us increased traceability uh, so that we can actually trace our transaction from, say, the product page through products, reviews, and ratings, and also uh, provide you other possibilities to secure and manage uh, your microservice. You want the camera now? So now we have uh, the API uh, gateway. So we now want to appify 
our service mesh. And so the idea is we have our API gateway, uh, in this case, Software AG's API gateway, which is basically a, a portal that allows you to manage and create APIs, define policies. And the nice thing is there isn't a single YAML file anywhere. You're going to be using a web UI. It's much more user-friendly. You can define policies quickly and easily uh, without having to go through reams of different documentation to figure out how to do it. And for the actual runtime part, we're going to be using the micro gateway, which is uh, a lightweight uh, component uh, that we can actually uh, run within uh, Kubernetes. Well, the API gate will be running within Kubernetes as well. It's also deployable. Uh, but the micro gateway is designed uh, as a stateless lightweight container so that it can run uh, alongside the microservices in a sidecar uh, scenario so that we can actually scale um, directly the performance of the two together. If we look at that, uh, as we said, the advantage there is we can now start to define a single API, which will uh, uh, group these uh, different uh, services together. So rather than having um, to deal with all of the different endpoints, uh, uh, documentation and strategies, I have a single API. I can start to define a set of policies um, and I can define those policies separately for securing my north-south uh, communication as opposed to east-west. And the other advantage uh, for the consuming application is that it's completely platform agnostic. They don't need to know that we're implementing uh, uh, this platform using Istio or Kubernetes. Um, they will just see a simple API based on a REST, HTTPS calls, JSON payload. They don't need to worry about anything else. So we have this much more simplified vision uh, where they see just this and only this, they can clearly identify the different resources. Um, all of this documentation will be available online through uh, uh, the API portal because we can we can define the API within our API gateway and then we can publish it to our API portal uh, where developers can view the documentation. And also more importantly, they can actually go through the process of actually uh, subscribing to the API. So one of the policies we're going to see today is to ensure that not anybody can just call our API. They need to register to use our API. They need to be known in advance. We call that the onboarding process. And using our API gateway and portal solution, that's a, a process that's actually completely uh, um, automated and uh, managed uh, uh, through a workflow that's uh, that they, they go through uh, within the user interface. So just before we uh, go on to the demonstration, let's just look at the architecture that we're going to see. So we're actually going to see two different scenarios. We're, we're going to actually see um, an example where we define an API gateway using the API gateway, <laughs> um, and then we're going to deploy it um, using uh, micro gateways that are actually running independently of the microservices. So it's, it's going to be a micro gateway that actually aggregates different services uh, in the back end to expose this single vision of an API. Um, the micro gateway uh, will be hosted within the same namespace as uh, the service mesh. So it's an equal citizen. So we'll actually be able to manage the micro gateway through Istio. Uh, we'll be able to take advantage of all of the uh, traceability and transaction monitoring that we get with Istio to manage our micro gateway. Um, but it will actually be running uh, in front of the microservices and it will be able to leverage the different microservices through what we call dynamic routing uh, uh, in order to ensure that the front end only sees a single endpoint. Um, but we'll also have a second use case where we're going to actually leverage uh, the micro gateway in a sidecar deployment with a specific microservice. Now, why would you want to do this? Uh, well, in this case, uh, the advantage is we can actually cover the deficiencies of, uh, you know, typical service mesh uh, platform. So here we're talking more about actually adding policies to what we call the east-west traffic. So the advantage, uh, so, you know, rather than uh, putting in place an API, uh, uh, we're actually looking at extending um, and enriching uh, the type of policies that they we want at the east-west uh, um, side. Um, the advantage being that we don't have to do that through YAML files. Uh, there are certain things like if you want to put in place like OAuth 2 authentication, uh, if you do that with the API gateway, it's just a few clicks. Um, you deploy the micro gateway. Um, it's much simpler to, to put in place than uh, doing that on your own uh, in a typical service mesh architecture.
So we're going to actually see both of these examples as part of this uh, demo. So um, I'm going to switch uh, screens. I'm just going, hopefully this will work. Let me just check that. Can we see the new screen? Yes, good. So as part of this uh, demo, the first thing that we're going to actually uh, look at is uh, to discover Kubernetes. So I'm just going to go into Kubernetes. Uh, this big problem with Kubernetes dashboard it always wants to log you out. So I have to copy paste my token back in. Okay, so here now we can see within Kubernetes, uh, I have a number of different namespaces. Uh, for this project, I've placed everything specific to service mesh within a, a namespace called mesh. <laughs> and in here, you can see um, we have a number of deployments. The deployments represent the different um, uh, microservices that we saw before in the slides. Uh, and here we can start to see uh, the power of using uh, versioning within your naming. Uh, so that you can actually manage different versions of the same uh, microservice uh, running at the same time in production. And then using what we call virtual services, we can actually decide which one we actually want to leverage. Uh, we also have uh, an additional uh, deployment uh, called API Facade, uh, which is basically uh, the web methods uh, micro gateway. So this is the micro gateway that I talked about earlier, which is going to be responsible for um, implementing uh, or aggregating the microservices into a single API. We can see that at the instance level. So the deployments is the definition. And then if we switch to the pods view, we can actually see the instances that are running. So you can actually see my API, API facade gateway is actually running two nodes. So already it's in a kind of like a robust, uh, high availability scenario. I'm actually, there's actually two micro gateways running side by side. Uh, which will then leverage the underlying uh, microservices that we see here that are running. If I go into, for instance, one of these uh, pods, uh, we can see the, the, the different components. So if I look at the log file, for instance, you can see that we have uh, two components. We have details, that's basically the runtime that's actually implementing the microservice. And we have the famous uh, sidecar proxy provided by uh, Istio, uh, which we can see here. If we go back to the uh, API facade one, we can see the log file for our micro gateway. So here I can actually see uh, that it's it's up and running. We actually already have an API uh, that's actually already deployed, and that's what we're going to uh, look at in a moment. If we switch from that vision, we can also uh, start to uh, view uh, the service mesh. Uh, here we have a, a dashboard from Kiali that actually is pretty cool because it gives me uh, the ability to visualize the relationship between these different uh, containers. So I can see how my product page is uh, calling uh, re the reviews microservices or the details microservice. Um, it allows you to separate um, the, the different layers. So we talked about the famous abstraction layer of services. So it's important to bear in mind that the different components will not call uh, directly the workloads. As we said, you might have multiple uh, instances of uh, some of these uh, components running. So if we look at the API facade, as we saw, there are two instances running. So you don't want to reference one of those specifically. Uh, you want to be able to uh, go through some kind of load balancer. And in fact, that's represented, as we said, through this service layer. As you can see, this, uh, the, the configuration that we put in place, there's no concept of, um, uh, of versioning. Um, so in fact, we decided for this demo, or the, the demo that I took, uh, is actually uh, dynamically uh, routing uh, through to the various different versions in the back end. So we, we configured a service that does just routing based arbitrarily on the various versions that are, are available. And we can actually see that if we go to the web page or product details, because here you can see the details of my book. And in fact, uh, the thing you'll notice is when I refresh the page, the uh, number of stars, either there are no stars or their stars appear. If I do it again, maybe they change color. And in fact, that's the different versions. Uh, version one has no stars. Version two has just black and white, and then uh, the version three is actually introducing color in, into the stars. So here we can see directly uh, this idea of dynamic routing uh, within the service mesh layer. 
And if I go back to this page here now, I can actually also start to see uh, through the workload uh, and the graph uh, statistics on the execution. So I can actually, it's starting to show green lines of the last execution that was carried out. And I can also start to see more relationships between the different components because uh, this graph is generated dynamically based on the actual data as it flows uh, through uh, the solution. So uh, what we want to do now is uh, we want to be able to leverage these microservices from outside of um, uh, Kubernetes, from the outside world. And so we want to build what we call an API. So that's what we're going to look at now. In order to do that, I need to open a, a new window. And I need to go to my gateway. So I'll put that on this page here so we can see it. Okay, so this is Software AG's API gateway uh, that allows you uh, a very simple, easy interface in order to create, well, you can import existing API Swagger documents. You can create an API from scratch using this. Um, and what we're going to look at first is this idea of App Mesh. App Mesh actually allows us to query uh, the backend uh, Kubernetes environment to find out what microservices are available. So first of all, I have to configure that. It's very simple to set up. I'm just going to the administration page. I go into the part on external accounts, service mesh, and I just need to retrieve the configuration file. This is the same configuration file that is used by the Kubernetes dashboard. So um, we use the, the same file to, to do that. Um, so it's found it, it seems okay. I still have one more thing to do, um, and that is to ensure that if I want to do this kind of dynamic injection of our micro gateway, so one of the features I can show you today is that we can actually deploy in a single click uh, the micro gateway in a sidecar environment to start checking and validating our policies. No YAML files, no command line interface. Everything is done uh, very quickly with a simple click. Um, but in order to do that, when I deploy the components, I need to know what my where the image is for my micro gateway. So I'm just going to paste these uh, attributes in. Okay, the port is 4485. Uh, we need to uh, reference our service mesh namespace. And then I need to also give it the API gateway. Our micro gateway, when it's deployed, is, is a black box. It basically uh, has very little configuration that's required. Uh, in fact, when we start up the micro gateway, the only parameters it requires is a URL of the API gateway, a username, a password, and that's it. Um, basically what the micro gateway does when it starts up, it's, it queries uh, your API gateway centrally to find out what APIs and policies that it should be managing. And then based on that, uh, it will auto configure. And, uh, I might, I've got a space there, I think, yeah. So now I'm going to save that. And now if I go back to the app mesh page, voila, now I can start to see uh, the microservices uh, from within here and I can start uh, appifying them. So if I click on details, for instance, it's basically pulling all the information uh, about the microservice. I can see that it's managed by Istio because I can actually see the uh, Istio uh, configuration in front of the, the microservice there. And I can uh, start to appify it. And as I said, I can even dynamically deploy uh, the micro gateway in real time. We're going to see that in a moment. So if I click on the Appify button, it just simply allows uh, me to create an API. So it saves me some time, so I don't have to enter things manually. So in fact, here we see it. It just created this. It's still deactivated for the moment. It's called Details V1. Um, but we're going to come back to that. I want to actually look at this north-south uh, approach that we talked about earlier with, with uh, this idea of creating a new API that will combine different um, that will combine different uh, microservices together. So here I've actually defined an API called Books. I created it from scratch directly from within this interface. You can see that the nice thing about it being an API is I have all of the contractual information that I need. So I know that I have a resource called details. I can see that it requires a query parameter called ISBN. Uh, well, actually, it's not required. Um, and I can even uh, see uh, an example of the response that I would expect to get back from this particular API call. If we scroll down, we can see the same thing for the uh, products. 
Um, so if we look at products, same thing. Uh, we can implement mocking if we need to bypass the service level. And lastly, I can now finally get hold of a real Swagger file and share that with somebody else. I could also publish this API to the API portal so that it will be documented within your uh, public window so that external developers can actually start to, to leverage this API. If we uh, move on to the policies, uh, we have this nice visual representation, not a single YAML file anymore, uh, anywhere, sorry. And here we can start to see the different types of policies uh, grouped by the phase life cycle of the transaction. So here I can see within the identify and access, I actually added uh, the first step to securing ac access to my API. So I need an API key. Uh, I can do some nice simple transformations. So I can do payload transformation, uh, this is extremely hard to do at the service mesh uh, layer, for instance. Uh, but here I'm just uh, simply mapping the ISBN query parameter, and I'm actually mapping it to a path parameter that's required uh, really by the microservice behind the scenes. And uh, not least, monitoring. We'd like to have our own level of monitoring within uh, the API level. And as you can see here, you can actually configure multiple and different backend uh, uh, destinations. Here I'm using the Elasticsearch. It's actually uh, being leveraged uh, by my API gateway. And the last thing is the dynamic routing to make sure that I can route through to the various different uh, microservices. So we have a, a single vision for our, our API, and then based on the path, uh, the resource, in fact, I'm switching to the appropriate microservice uh, using uh, routing rules, but you can configure visually, again, uh, very easy to do. So uh, that's the API. I can uh, deploy it, um, and uh, the only thing I need to do is restart my micro gateway API facade. As I said, that's already been done to save some time, so I can see that it's already been deployed here. Uh, if we look um, at a client app here, so we saw before calling products. I can also call the microservice. Uh, I have actually created an ingress for my uh, product microservice, so I can call it here. And I can now also leverage the uh, public API. So here I can see now the books API. And I'll hide that for a moment. I shouldn't see that yet. And now I'm going to call the products. And as you can see, it's unauthorized. So already we're now starting to see uh, the difference between uh, the two uh, solutions. Here now uh, I can see it's unauthorized. I need to provide what's called an API key. So I haven't got time to go through the onboarding process. Uh, I've actually already defined an application here called Test App, uh, which I've linked to, to the Books API. Um, so I've already recovered the API access key. I can now add that to my header. I can re-launch uh, my query, and it works. If we go back to the API, we can actually see that within the logging as well. So we have the logging within the API gateway that actually allows me to see those different calls, so I can see the success and failures. If I scroll down, I can even see uh, the individual transactions, so I can see whether it succeeded or not. So if we just change uh, there, so 16, so we can see there's one there, po policy violation, that was the one that was refused. I can access all the, the details uh, of this API. So that's the, the first example that we saw. Now, quickly, uh, before we finish, I would like to just show uh, how I can do that in live. So the idea now is I'm going to go back to the API that we created on the fly just before. Uh, as, you, as you can see, because of the limits of uh, what we call the service mesh or microservices, um, we don't have much contractual information. I have nothing. So the idea here is I can now fill in the missing uh, details. So I know for details, it requires an ID uh, parameter. I'm going to specify that as a path parameter. It's required ID. Uh, I can add various, uh, I could actually add a pre-built value if I wanted to as well. Uh, so I've got that. So that's the to fulfill the resource definition. I can now switch to the policy section. Yeah, we want monitoring. So I'm going to add some monitoring. Um, uh, no, we won't do identifier to save some time. But the one thing I would like to show is uh, the kind of transformation that we can do to the payload. So a nice simple tra tra um, transformation that I can do off the fly. 
uh, on the fly here is data masking. So I'm going to actually uh, put in some masking uh, so that the author, so before when I clicked on, for instance, details here, you can see that there's an attribute called author. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mask that out. I'm going to add that and uh, save. So I've got my API, I'll activate it. Um, however, it won't be uh, it won't be live yet because I haven't deployed uh, the micro gateway in Sidecar. So I'm going to go back to my app mesh. I'm going to click on details, and now you can see that the deploy button is available because I've created the API. I can now click on the deploy button, and effectively, it's now deployed. I can see it's injected the micro, micro gateway into the east west. Uh, communication between Istio and the underlying microservice. Uh, if I go to Kubernetes, I can actually see that now because as you can see, it's restarted the container for details. And if I have a look, uh, I can look at the log files and in the log files, I can see now, I can see the Istio prefix, I can see SAG details, and I can see it's successfully retrieved the API and its policy definitions. And if I go back to the uh, client app, uh, if I rerun that service, I can see, voila, I no longer see the author. It's now masked out with uh, a set of stars. So uh, that concludes uh, the demonstration. I hope we've shown there clearly how uh, an API uh, gateway, such as software AGs, uh, can actually you know, enhance uh, your microservice architecture. Uh, as I said, you could actually use it to uh, secure east-west traffic uh, if you do not want to deploy a solution like uh, Istio, or you can actually use it to uh, extend an ex existing service mesh apart from this idea of using it to actually create APIs where there are no APIs. So um, I think we can go over now to uh, questions. If anybody has questions, uh, I think we're quite close to the end. Thank you very much.
Oh, I never showed the one. Thank you.